This video provides a brief introduction to dynamic finite element analysis, focusing initially on the one-dimensional elements bar and beam. There are three types of dynamic analysis that, are, that we're going to discuss in finite element analysis. First one is normal modes natural frequencies. These are the natural frequencies of vibration of the system, and the normal modes are the mode shapes or the deformation shapes that are associated with those natural frequencies. Second case is a harmonic response. Harmonic response is an interesting one. It is a dynamic analysis in that things change with time, but things repeat. So it is a repetitive motion. I call it a steady state response. Um, it's kind of a steady state response. It's not a static response. You want to make clear that, that those are two different things. There is motion, but it's, it repeats itself. And the neat thing about a harmonic response is you can do the normal modes national frequency analysis and then build those modes together to construct the harmonic response. And that's actually how it's done in FEM. The third category is the most broad, the transient response. You can have any sort of variation with time captured in this kind of analysis. It is much more time consuming to perform. There are two main types, implicit and explicit, and so we'll deal with those separately. Before we can actually see how FE is implemented, we need to do a quick review of what the dynamic equations of motions are for a system. We're going to start out with a single degree of freedom system. So what we've been looking at is something like this. Our structure is represented as um, something with a stiffness k. It's just we have to figure out what the k is. If it's a single degree of freedom, there's only one thing that can move. In this case, it would be that bar down at the bottom attached to the spring. Then what we do is we apply a force to that system and we track the displacement. And then the FE method has just been the stiffness times the displacement is equal to the force. And we're solving that for a multi-degree of freedom problem. But the same thing applies for a single degree of freedom. What we're doing with dynamic is adding some to this equation. So first off, we're going to add the possibility of having some damping in the system where the damping is dependent on the speed of the motion, so the d dot. And then third, we're going to add a mass where the response of the system, the mass influences the response of the system to accelerations. So F equals MA, that, that's the term we're talking about here. So we have three terms now in the dynamic equations of motion. MD double dot plus CD dot plus KD is equal to F. Now that was the 1D case. What about for multiple degrees of freedom? Well, it's actually pretty similar we have our basic FE equation that we've been dealing with in, in all these other videos. That is for a static case. Then we have the force vector and the stiffness matrix. We are adding in a damping matrix and a mass matrix, giving us this full system equation. So in addition to the stiffness matrix and the force vector that you already know about, we're going to need to define a damping matrix and a mass matrix in order to do a full multiple degree of freedom system solution in FEA. Here, just a, a few quick notes. The degree of freedom vector that we're looking at is just um, a function of time. So in the past, the degree of freedom was not a function of anything. It was, certainly was not a function of position. Um, it is now a function of time. And the displacement field in a 3D problem, this would be U, V, and W, each one of those terms is a function of position as well as time. So what is this mass matrix and this C or, or damping matrix? Well, to, order, to understand what those are, we really need to go back and talk about what the stiffness matrix really is. We've derived this thing, but what does it physically mean? So here are a couple of thoughts. Um, it represents the relationship between the loads and displacements at each of the nodes in the element. And that's sort of the terminology that we've been using in all of these videos, but I don't think that really gets at physically what's going on. Let's look specifically at one column of a stiffness matrix. We'll call it column J. The Jth column of K is the set of the nodal loads that are needed to create a displacement at degree of freedom J. So let's say this is the third column of K. We are looking at the third degree of freedom, uh, D sub 3. Uh, we want that to have a displacement of 1, and then all the other degrees of freedom to be equal to 0. So in other words, we have a load vector that is the load vector that produces a unit displacement in only one direction, only at one degree of freedom. All right, still a bit confusing, right? Let's look again a bit more physically at this. 
bar element stiffness matrix, right? We've developed this before. It's a simple two by two matrix. The first column of K can be written as a force term. It is AE over L and one minus one. It has units of force per length, but remember we're gonna use a, a distance of one, a displacement of one. So the force per length is simply going to become force. So that is supposed to represent the two force terms need to, needed to achieve a displacement of one at node one. So suppose we have this bar element and then we're going to apply a force on the left side of it, F1. That's going to change the length of our element. Uh, but wait, it's only gonna change the length of the element if we have a reaction force at the other end, F2. So if we do that, then impose the restriction that the displacement produced in that process is equal to a magnitude of one, so D1 equals one, then F1 has to equal F2 in magnitude, otherwise we don't have a static system anymore, it's a dynamic system. So F1 has to equal F2, and both of them have to equal AE over L, the resistance to deflection in the bar element. So this is true. For the first column of K, it does represent the two forces that have to be applied at the nodes in order to give you a displacement at one of one at the first node. How about the second column? Well, we'll see it's the same thing. Here's our basic bar element. Now what we want is a displacement at node two. So I'm gonna apply F2 at node two. That's gonna make my element grow, but only if I have a restraining force or a reaction force at F1. And if I then impose that D2 has to equal one, the same condition applies. The magnitude of F1 and F2 have to be equal, and they both have to be equal to AE over L. And that's how we pick up the minus sign in the first term of the, that vector, the column vector, for F1 has to be negative, pointing to the left to restrain things. So that's the physical interpretation of these terms in the stiffness matrix. Let's take that physical interpretation over to the mass matrix. Assume things are similar. Well, fundamentally, the mass matrix represents the relationship between loads and accelerations at each of the nodes of the element. The, the relationship between loads and accelerations is something that we call mass. So it makes sense that this is a mass matrix. But what are the columns representing? Well, just like with the stiffness matrix, a particular column, let's call it column three of the mass matrix, is the set of nodal loads that are needed to create an acceleration of magnitude one in, let's see, I said this was the third column, so it's in the third degree of freedom direction, and all of the other accelerations will be zero. So that's what that column ever means. It means, in other words, it is another load vector, but now it produces a unit acceleration in the direction of whatever degree of freedom that column is associated with. That's what the mass matrix is. Similarly, the damping matrix is this same relationship, but between loads and speeds at each node. So that's what those matrices represent. Let's look a little bit more closely at the mass matrix. There are actually two types of mass matrices. There are consistent mass matrices and lumped mass matrices. First off, consistent mass matrix. It's defined by this equation. This looks kind of similar to what uh, we had for K. Um, we've got a, a mass term, or rather a density term in the middle there. That's sort of equivalent to the D matrix, the material property matrix. And then instead of the B matrix transpose and the B matrix itself before and after this row term, we're going to have the shape function matrices. For a bar element, if we plug in what those shape function matrices are, again, remember that's one minus X over L and X over L, and then we multiply those out. I'm also gonna convert DV to ADX. If I then assume that my cross-sectional area is constant and my density is constant, so I can take them out of the integral, then this becomes the consistent mass matrix for the bar element. The assembly process works exactly the same way as stiffness matrices. So if you're doing it by hand, you would identify the row and the column, which degrees of freedom they're associated with, and you put them together to assemble. Same process. Just to make sure you've got the process down, let's look at the simple beam element, get that consistent mass matrix. The simple beam element is the one that only has transverse deflection and slope change as its degrees of freedom. So no axial load. So this is the 
four by four stiffness matrix term. So we're also going to end up with a four by four mass matrix. So we've got a consistent mass matrix expression. We plug in our uh, shape function matrix. Remember for the shape functions here, we had to have a row corresponding to the transverse displacement and then another row that corresponded to the slope change variable. Plugging in what each of those shape functions is equal to, taking the derivatives, doing the multiplication, we end up with the matrix shown right here. Now, um, again, this is assuming constant area and density. So I've skipped a whole bunch of steps there, but you see this is the process it works similarly defining a stiffness matrix. There's one really big problem with what I just said. It's similar to finding a stiffness matrix. Well, that requires a decent amount of calculations to find a stiffness matrix. If we do that also for the mass matrices in all of our elements, we are adding quite a bit of time. And as we'll see later, doing a dynamic analysis already takes a lot of time. So um, there's a shortcut. The shortcut is that we use a lumped mass matrix. And as you see here, lumped mass matrix simply means that we lump the mass at each of the nodes. In the case of a bar or a beam element, that means we put half the mass at each of the two nodes. So when I do that, I get a bar element mass matrix that's just diagonal and ones on the diagonal. The mass matrix for a um, simple beam element is even simpler than that. It's just the two terms and I don't have anything for the, the slope change degrees of freedom. So zeros in those columns and rows. So why don't we do this all the time? Well, we left something out, right? We're missing all those off diagonal terms. Those off diagonal terms are basically mass moments of inertia. So in a 2D and 3D problem, we're losing a little bit of information. But here's the cool thing. Remember, F is an approximate solution method, and our elements get smaller to get more accurate. Well, as your element gets smaller, the influence of its own mass moment of inertia becomes trivial compared to the overall system mass moment of inertia. So small elements, it's perfectly fine to use lumped mass matrices. And so for most dynamic analyses, you will be using lumped mass matrices.